It is wonderful to see this room full of friends and well-wishers of Ranjini and global adjustments for the launch of Upwardly Mobile. Penguin is proud to have published this book in its business imprint, Penguin Portfolio. What it tells is important to enable us to conduct business with confidence and self-esteem in a globalized world. Ranjani draws on her vast interaction as CEO of Global Adjustments over 16 years with C-level executives of thousands of multi multinationals from 76 nationalities. And it offers us an indispensable companion, particularly for young people and young managers, as they prepare to deal with India in the world, as Shashi Tharoor has put it. So we have this evening with us uh, Jennifer McIntyre, Dr. Sumantran, who will be in conversation with Ranjini Manyan. Ms. McIntyre is Council General for the United States of America. And then there's Dr. Sumantran, who is Executive Vice Chairman of Hinduja Automobiles uh, UK, the auto and manufacturing sector holding company of the Hinduja Group, and Chairman Ashok Lel in Nissan Limited. He's been Chief Executive of Tata Motors, and prior to that was with General Motors for 16 years in the US. Ranjani Manyan is of the city zone, and really needs no introduction, but still. Doing Business in India for Dummies was her first book, and it has done really well. She started Culturama, the first free cultural magazine for expats, and has a portal for cross-cultural e-learning. She served on the Women's Leadership Board at Harvard University. And with that, I would uh, request uh, Ranjani to take the evening forward. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and it's a great honor and a delight for me to come back full circle to the Taj Hotel, because my first job was in the Taj Hotel in Mumbai. Thank you, Prakash, uh, Sanjukta, and the whole team at Taj for believing in Upworldly Mobile, and thank you, Penguin, for being a wonderful publisher that I'm very proud to be associated with. Especially thank you all for being here on the in the middle of the week on an evening spending time with us to listen to cultural intelligence. What I'm happy to do is first maybe just ask Dr. Sumantran and um, Jennifer McIntyre. To me, this is a dream that I have the two leaders, the epitome of a global Indian, Dr. Sumantran. I've always looked up to you for that. And Jennifer, to have a woman in this post, you're the third woman that I have seen in this post to head up the mission in Chennai. Um, to especially have you on this podium with us is, is a terrific honor. So can I ask by um, asking you to maybe define, the book is about cultural intelligence and using that to be able to show um, behavior, of behavior that is different culture to culture, depicting the value that is underneath. So would you describe to me, in your own words, what is cultural intelligence? How would you define it? To me, I think, uh in this audience, everybody understands the word intelligence. But I would say if you look at cultural intelligence, uh, it, to me it goes back to three building blocks. To me it starts first with curiosity. You know, uh, we always see people going into new societies, new uh, cultures. Absent that curiosity, you don't have the spark that ignites the need to learn. I think there is certainly a very large component of observation. I think uh, I've seen people spend numerous visits to certain countries and go away vacant mm. in their understanding of what it is. So observation, powers of observation doubtless are an important ingredient. I think uh, with the two, I think there is also this additional component of uh, having an open mind to let new ideas sink in or to get past that first uh, filter that says, I don't want it. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I can uh, therefore paraphrase the definition of the word cultural intelligence, but to me I think cultural intelligence must embody at least these and perhaps other uh, characteristics. That's great. That's terrific. You talked about COO. You talked about curiosity observation <laughs> and open-mindedness. I think that makes perfect yeah, and I, sense. I would agree with everything that uh, Dr. Samantran says. And um, clearly a sensitivity as well, um, in, and both in the send and the receive mode. So 
uh, to be able to recognize when somebody who's unfamiliar with your culture is looking uncomfortable and see those cues, um, and also uh, for yourself as well. And then to recognize also what your cultural quibbles are, if you will. Um, certainly being in multiple uh, countries overseas and with a very outspoken staff at a lot of the embassies mm -hmm. who have said, you know, you Americans, um, that you suddenly recognize and you see it when you go back to your own country, that yes, there are peculiarities about how we deal with things. And knowing that makes it a lot easier to help uh, other cultures understand why we do things and, and why those values are there. So you add sensitivity to it. And but also an ability to understand and, and laugh at you know, the, your own cultural. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in your book, I was laughing at some of the observations. And uh, you mentioned about queuing and how uncomfortable it makes Westerners feel. And it isn't unique to India to not necessarily do a very uh, straight queue. I've been in other countries where it looks like just a big crowd, and it's really uh, disconcerting, I think, for, for an American to say, OK, well, how do you actually get the service, or how do you get to where you need, because you don't understand where, where things start. So I, I saw a lot of observations in uh, the book toward the American side that I thought were absolutely correct. Great. Thank you. So maybe I could ask you a question to give very sp specific stories. Could you share a story on adaptation or a cultural typical um, a cross-cultural situation that you faced and you adapted to or something that happened that tells a good anecdote? Well, we are all uh, uh, by now uh, familiar with uh, the Indian concept of punctuality. Uh, <laughs> I remember that uh, the time that my wife and I lived in Sweden, uh, you tell your colleagues or friends, come on over for dinner tonight, or, and they'd say, yeah, what time? And say, oh, about 7.30. And uh, my wife and I used to be really embarrassed because cars would pull into the driveway at 7.28, and uh, they wouldn't ring the doorbell until, and they would wait outside until it was 7.30 and they'd ring the doorbell. And uh, so we were naturally impressed. We tried to adapt. We tried to uh, tune up our own sense of punctuality. And uh, soon after I got back to India uh, in 2001, I had an invitation to a wedding reception for a colleague's daughter. And uh, the reception invitation said, uh, reception, 7.30 p.m. So I finished work a little early, went over to the guest house, showered, and by 7.15 I was in the car with enough time to get to the venue by 7.30. And I called my colleague, uh, Prakash Talam, managing director of Stata now. Mm -hmm. So I called Prakash and he said, Prakash, I'm on my way. Are you there? And he said, where are you going? And I said, well, to the reception. Are you crazy? You know? Even the host won't be there at 7.30. <laughs> so, uh, no, I think uh, we, we learn. We go through these changes. Sometimes in the experience, uh, you perhaps have abandoned your own uh, traditional culture. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it makes for humorous occasions. Yeah. And you have a story from all the years of Asia well, and Europe? I'm laughing at the the time as well, because that's one of the first things that we ask at different cultures. And uh, um, I, I was actually in a country where not only did they not come on time, they came early. I've only been to one. <laughs> that's very disconcerting. I've never been in a place where people come a half hour early because it, we're not ready. But uh, um, certainly Americans, uh, from what I've experienced, usually eat earlier than most people do. And since it's my second month here, I'm still getting accustomed to the customs here. And the way that dinners, for example, uh, happen are opposite to the way they would be in the U.S. So people come, they talk for a couple hours, and then they eat very late. In the U.S., you would sit down and eat, and then you'd spend a couple hours talking over coffee, whereas when everybody's done, they usually leave. Um, and so that's been a little bit of adjustment. Fortunately, we have people uh, over at the consulate that understand that Americans are not going to understand their first dinner party, and that's explained to us you know, to, in the beginning that... You, you will eat much later than you would expect, and then, and then everybody will leave. We say, well, what about coffee? Well, it doesn't work that way here. So. 
Jennifer, don't tell us Indians are late. We come very early to queue up for our visas outside your door. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen us? You tell us, come 20 minutes before the visa. We're there two hours before. So when we want to be on time, we can be on time. Okay. <laughs> but if I can ask you just um, from the perspective of, so how does this tie into the workplace, Dr. Sumantran? You've, you've been the brain behind our wonderful Nano, you were CEO of Tata Motors at the time. You handled a very smart workforce that brought all that to happen. You did it with GM. You've done doing it again now with uh, Nissan Leyland. How does this tie into the workplace? What is it that we need to do to apply cultural intelligence with our 50% of 1.2 billion who are 25 years old? You know, I think uh, this really just came to my mind even as you were speaking. I think uh, there is definitely uh, a different approach to life, a different approach to work between the typical Western societies and typical Indian society. And I go beyond the cliches. You know, I think technically, I, I honestly believe that there is a very strong element of structure and discipline in Western thought, Western idea. And there is a great emphasis on adaptability in Indian culture and Indian ideas. And one can imagine uh, that there would be phenomenal uh, implications of this in the workplace. To start with, you know, you take Western music. It's extremely structured. You play to a score. Indian music is completely the opposite. It's all improvisation and adaptation. Uh, a Western wedding has a rehearsal dinner. I mean, the Indian wedding <laughs> is uh, left to your imagination, uh, the, the uh, epitome of adaptability. Uh, when, you, when you get down to the workplace, uh, without a doubt, in fact, uh, if I speak personally, one of the big learnings that I came out of uh, leaving GM to come back was the amount of emphasis G that GM had placed in a structured product development process. I mean, this was the time that GM was trying to catch up to Toyota. And a lot of emphasis on, was on organized work and work structures and uh, uh, disciplined timetables and execution. And frankly, uh, and perhaps uh, not surprisingly, Indian work cultures carry a lot of this sense of adaptability into the workplace. Uh, in fact, uh, our current Japanese uh, collaborators, the joint venture partners, Nissan, I'm sure we drive them crazy. Um, you know, we, on the other hand, uh, I wouldn't dismiss this as uh, uh, a complete uh, failure because there is virtue in this ability to adapt. Uh, we used to find at Tata Motors after a very detailed benchmarking exercise that indeed the total quantum of resources we committed to a certain program was related, was really grossly inadequate compared to the quantum of resources allocated to a comparable Western program. Right. And yet, in our perhaps uh, characteristically Indian and perhaps clumsy way, we got the job done uh, at the given date. Mm -hmm. It didn't look pretty, but the job got done. And uh, now there is, there is a unique virtue in this. Uh, and, and therefore, one can only imagine that if we were to truly create the, the hybrid, the best of the appropriate level of discipline and the appropriate level of adaptability and uh, because we all live in a world that's unpredictable. Adaptability is a very strong virtue. Uh, one could truly build uh, an even more important uh, and more effective uh, working culture.